introduce uh, Ginter Grumbach. Uh, he is from Austria, but now he is living in Prague. Uh, his original background is from linguistic uh, and literature, concretely from uh, Italian, French, and English. Yes. English literature and linguistics. But uh, his interest lies near journalism, uh, information technology, uh, particularly digital technology. Uh, he is consultant here at Masaryk University, consultant of technology transfer. Yes. And he will speak about, uh, about the opposition of paper and digital media. Uh, he will uh, speak about topics, the books and the net. So, my Thank you. A děkuji za zájem, za velký zájem. A nebojte se, ta přednáška bude určitě anglicky, protože po takhle věci moje čeština neby stačila. Tak uh, so the lecture is actually called the book and the internet and when I worked on it I realized actually that the issue I'm going to talk about is much larger. So I hope you will not be angry that I'm going far beyond the pure uh, positioning of these two media. And uh, I will also be quite provocative sometimes. And I would definitely be very happy about your active participation at any point of this uh, lecture because I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not here to talk one and a half hours and have you just listen. And if uh, in English it doesn't work, so please ask me in Czech, but slowly. Um, first, some information. I was already introduced. Uh, I would describe myself as a writer, speaker and preacher. Originally, I studied English and French and Italian linguistics and literature in Vienna. And then I realized that I actually didn't want to become a teacher. So. Um, as journalism and media have always been interesting, I stumbled into information technology actually by chance and uh, I am a digital user from the first moment, meaning from 1995 when the internet became commercial. And since then followed this development till today and wrote quite some stuff on this, eight books altogether. <coughs> about European information technology markets uh, because I realized that basic developments seem always to come from North America or the Far East. And I realized that there's a lot of uh, achievements here in Europe that nobody is talking about. And so I started to investigate and I checked uh, the Austrian uh, research and development community and then w went beyond these borders and also did quite a lot on research here in the Czech Republic and I saw and I found quite a lot of hidden treasures which nobody basically knows about because these things are not user programs but mainly things that are built in something else. Well, there are quite a few interesting <coughs> pardon, quite a few interesting things going on here also at this university. I'm also consulting the faculty on inf of informatics in the area of technology transfer. So I have some insight. Uh, it was actually a Microsoft Congress that made me come to Prague in 2005 after a long time. I had been in Prague for the first time in 1986. I hope this tells you something. This was three times before the summit of Revoluce. And basically the city was almost breaking apart. And I came back in 2005 after quite a long time and was very impressed on how the country changed. And it caught me somehow and I said, actually, I wanted to experience one of these former Eastern Bloc countries myself. And I wanted that challenge. Waited two years, you know, kind of thinking. And then in 2007, uh, changed my homeland. And since then, have been living here and <coughs> I'm quite happy about that. Busily learning Czech and discovering the secrets of this country. Uh, 
I divided the whole thing into two parts. And in part one, I wanted to talk about your basic background here, information management, and I rather call it information mastering. And I will come back to why I call it rather mastering than management. And uh, the first few slides will be very familiar to you. You know all these things. This is nothing new. But you will see why I'm kind of building up this issue the way I did it. So I'm kind of giving you a, a well-known uh, definition of information. And you know that it has lots of different aspects depending on the, on the, on the, on the area you look at it from the psychological point of view, from a technological point of view, etc., etc. The main sentences we're receiving or getting or being confronted with information all the time. And it's getting more and more. <coughs> and uh, to be able to build up that issue, also uh, repeat uh, something very familiar, just to recall what it is. In this picture, the information is very simple. It's a cookie and the little puppy sees that this is something eatable because it smells it. And contrary to that, this diagram, which you can't read, and that's the purpose of it, uh, is a very complex piece of information. It's actually, it has a triple meaning. It's meta-information and information at the same time because it's showing the system processes of the cognitive model, so what's cognition and how does it run. And it shows at the same time how complex the issue is. And it shows you what today we are confronted with in terms of information, especially in the technological area, in the academic area, and so on and so on. And in a corporate context, in the companies where you will, maybe we will work once, you have a lot of complex information, facts and figures, reports, technology, science, etc., etc., etc. But information itself is not yet useful. It has no value unless we process it. And then the complex, the complex procedures start. We have to acknowledge it and put it into a context. And I gave this very, very primitive example. To see a red car itself doesn't mean anything. And of unlimited options of interpretation, I chose just four. One of them could be that we see it and we don't connect anything with it, forget it. Could be that it's connected with, uh, with a wish, connect, uh, connected with a warning. Or with the information, aha, I've been waiting so long, my friends arrive. So we structure and store information to be useful for us in our environment, very generally speaking. And this amount of information we're confronted with is constantly growing. Kind of heaping, heaping, really heaping information upon information. And I gave a few of an unlimited number of examples just to, you know, think about the figures. Uh, libraries, internet, and finally a graph that shows that today it's basically uh, a figure that goes close to unlimited. The question is, how shall we manage that? And for that, I come back to the notion of information management. Turning large amounts of diverse information into useful and well-organized units for the profit of somebody could be me personally, could be the school, could be anybody. I mean, we live, it's basically mental food nowadays. The question is whether we are really profiting from all this information, especially in growing amounts. And the question is, what can we do with it? I uh, gave you a few examples. This is too big to, show to be shown in detail, so I, I uh, give you a few of these figures that are on this graph 
called what happens in an internet minute. 20 new victims of identity theft, 204 million emails sent within a minute. And this is not from 2014, this is from 2011 or 12. So in the meantime, this has grown exponentially. 1,300 new mobile users, 47,000 app downloads, 83,000 83, uh, online sales, 100 new LinkedIn, 100 plus new LinkedIn acca accounts, 61,000 hours of music, 20 million photo views, etc., 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 etc. The one, the, the, the highest, the highest um, ranking is 1.3 million video views. And then they say in the conclusion today, the number of networked devices is equal to the global population. And by 2015, the number of networked devices, everything that's usable uh, in the web, in the World Wide Web or in the cloud is double the number of the global population. And I've given you an example here which is very close to what you might be confronted with when you work in a company. It's the diagram of information and information flow in a production during a production stage. So you have it centered around production, reject and failure analysis, inspection, statistical process control, and so on and so on and so on. And if this is a global corporation, that graph, that diagram will be much more complex even depending on the kind of production, the kind of uh, processes that, that run in such factories and information management in companies will be confronted with working on such things and partly their optimization and partly their communication. Is anybody of you or has anybody of you worked in a company in the field of your studies already? Any practice, any internships? So this will be partly something new for you. Another example is an area where enormous data are dealt with. It's a graph from uh, the National U.S. Water and Climate Center for the forecasting of uh, uh, snow and water levels in winter and in summer, warning from floods, etc., etc. E everything that's connected with meteorol meteorological data. Sorry. And a third example was very interested because it was very interesting because it was accompanied by a very interesting comment which in itself is not necessarily new but i think that that comment comes back to a very crucial sentence which i would like to put to discussion so this is maybe me or somebody else but that's how it is uh and the crucial word is actually omezeni informachni toki. And I will come back to these restrictions. And uh, this is, a l of, of course, an excerpt from a longer article. Uh, and then the, the this company, Dynamic Futures, he said, gives two graphs of which I have taken out one, which you can't read either but it's supposed to show what could happen if one allows all flows and all amounts of information and whatever happens to be put into a schematism. And then I have uh, asked the question, I said uh, information management is good for whom? Three assumptions out of many, everybody, or, which is more provocative, people who have maybe no other capacity for deciding, because if I can't decide myself, I decide upon the basis of facts and figures. And I say, it's written here. That's why I say it has to be like this, in a management process, for instance. And then the third assumption is, of course, 
Well, in this dimension, maybe this is just something for global players. Uh, if you think about the way today uh, big corporations, especially in the food sector, for instance, <laughs> collect data with all the cards you get in your wallet. When do you go shopping? What do you shop? How should the supermarket be arranged that you shop more? What should the products look like? What color do they get? What composition? Um, how do, as an oil company, for instance, gain the sympathy of the clients if something happens in one of my uh, working environments, like, for instance, in Nigeria, where they are devastating nature? And this comes into the media, so how do I get them back? Uh, and then the last two uh, examples are actually those who are very close to global information collecting. And I say, no, of course it's also good for us, for everybody. It's a common good. But maybe the main profiting units will be the information industry itself. And uh, one very intelligent comment from a German website says, the winners will be search machines, searching tools, and those people who see information as the basis of the future development of mankind. So this is really mental food in the meantime. He adds, and this is what I doubt a little bit, those who develop useful educational and didactic materials and so on and so on and so on. It's a very optimistic view. Well, sounds very good, but I think that the winner is the one who collects the best and most of the data from his clients so that there is more consumption and thus more profit. Um, this is what could happen if we think about the fact that just a few days ago Google acquired WhatsApp, which was supposed to be a little bit of an antithesis towards the global information collector. And these fusion processes are going on. And it's also interesting that, for instance, Amazon is going to build some logistic centers here in the Czech Republic. And on one hand, some people are against that, and on the other hand, it's an investment. So you already come into this ideological uh, dilemma, whether we need the investment and the workplaces, or we don't want another one of these big ones with us. The question is whether geography, geography is still a criterion anyway. This doesn't exist yet, by the way. Huh? Could happen. Now, is this going to be a world-dominating monopoly? Is the information industry going to be a world-dominating monopoly? Are you moving into a world where your jobs will help and support such developments? And I say it depends on the ability of the information industry to deliver correct data and make information more useful, which means all the industry, not just one mon monopolist. And I looked at actually on what kind of data we get from which kind of sources. Again, just a few examples. And uh, the fact is that Google and others at the moment deliver just everything if you put in a search query. I remember that a few years ago when you put in, for instance, Cafe Corso Praha, you got all kinds of stuff. It should be the words Cafe and Corso and Praha and you got 250,000 uh, results. It's nonsense. Nowadays you get quite good reactions today, but you still have thousands of results. If you put into Google, what's the time in English, you get the local time, plus lots of answers. If you put it, if you insert it in German, it gives you all the sentences that contain wie spät ist das in German, which is what, what's the time, which is nonsense, of course. So uh, we are by far not 
in the area of real semantic search. This would be also, by the way, an interesting discussion, together with translation machines and all that stuff. I'm looking at lots of websites very often that work with Google Translate, and it's hilarious. I made a collection of some of the comments, and I get I, I, I guess it will take another 20 years to develop a technology that will kind of, in a way, give you adequate texts. Some companies use these translations for their websites. And this is not hilarious anymore, this is already ridiculous and it damages the image of the company heavily. But I'm, I'm sitting and, and laugh the hell out of me because I mean, I'm coming from linguistics. So this is even worse. Uh, we will later on be talking about the quality of data and the translation is a quality criterion in terms of language. Um, another interesting test would be to try to find the facts and figures you need, uh, you want to have from the statistical pages of the European Union, Eurostat or Eurostat, which is an enormous bunch of information. Uh, coming, of course, from lots of different resources, from 27 different countries. Um, I And I'm really uh, an experienced internet researcher. Basically, I find what I want. I found an old facsimile from some Czech writer from the 16th century, where he says that it's actually a, a chapter about Smichov. This is a former suburb of Prague, and I, I don't know, I bumped into that text passage where it says that the dragon in Brno is not a dragon, but a crocodile. Uh, so I, I really find stuff that is almost impossible to find, because if I would have looked for it, I would have never found it. But uh, try to, to do some research on the statistical pages of the European Union, and uh, you will see what I mean. One of the examples I'm really picking out very often, and I will talk about that later also, is to find the correct data in international university rankings. Have you ever checked out where Masarika Universita is in international rankings? Have you ever asked the questions on these, you know, the Times uh, Educational Supplement, the University of Shanghai, lots of institutions produce rankings, and nowadays everything is being ranked because it's some, especially for the boulevard media, it's, it's fantastic, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed when media like Blesk talk about university rankings, you know. Uh, I'll elaborate on that later on. Uh, many data are connected to academic research, and here it becomes tricky, are contradictory. Just a few striking examples. The discussions about the greenhouse effect, Mr. Klaus always said it doesn't happen. Some others say it does happen. Now, Mr. Klaus was not or is not a scientist, but he has a voice internationally, you know. That's love, Klaus. Uh, there is a heavy discussion on the green mafia, that there are scientists who are producing data to influence certain developments. So the greenhouse effect, I'm not a biologist or uh, any kind of, I have no idea about climate. I just realize changes as a normal person. So I don't know what the greenhouse effect might do. I have to rely on the information that comes from science. But I don't know what's right. Healthy nutrition. You can read it in all the papers. On one hand, you have the classical recipes. Uh, yes, please. Uh, lots of protein and, 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 and little fat, and then they come with the right fat and the wrong fat, and the wrong cholesterol and the right cholesterol, and then tell you chocolate actually is much better than its uh, reputation, chocolate must m makes happy, you shouldn't have a bad conscience on it, etc., 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 etc. Nutrition is one of the areas, if you work in a food company, in the information management department someday, you will be the one who delivers the facts and figures to the PR department who's issuing that Kinder Chocolate is the best in the world and it's also healthy. Which is ironic. But wh whatever, you know. Um, the negative or positive consequences of genetically manipulated seeds, and there it gets really tricky because it concerns us all. 
is genetically manipulated food dangerous or not? Or is it helpful? Or does it give chances to people who so far have been uh, starving to death? Or is it uh, a monopoly for two big companies worldwide, this Monsanto and, and Pioneer, who are producing those seeds and have basically uh, the top position? I don't know. I'm suspicious. I get lots of information from different sides, but I don't know. Uh, interesting thing on data and the discussion on this is, for instance, European and US American unemployment statistics. In America, unemployment is counted by those who apply and register with the unemployment office. But unlike in Europe or in most European countries, you don't have to. So we don't know how high the percentage is who does not register with unemployment and therefore we have no figures. So if it says in the US it's 7% and like this it's maybe lower than the European average, we don't know whether these are the real figures or just the figures they, they publish. Uh, I've read about this only once. Um, also very interesting, of course, and everybody knows what happened in the last uh, five or six years, the business figures that were issued by certain US investment banks before they went bankrupt. Everything was fine. Everybody was happy. Wonderful stock exchanges were booming and suddenly we found out something's wrong. What happened to those figures? Where does the information come from? Who is able to produce such? manipulation and also interesting the reality behind figures on the gross domestic product if uh, a country has some let's say less wealthy country has a gross domestic product close to a more wealthy country it does not necessarily mean that all the people in this country are really wealthy it could be also that a small minority has a lot of money the rest of the population has no money but the average makes the gross domestic product. It's not the median, it's the average, which is usually measured. And then we work with these data. I worked for a while for the Austrian Business Agency. This is something like check invest and uh, check trade. And one of the main figures is always the comparison of the GDP of different countries. In Europe, it doesn't really matter. Western Europe, Central Europe are kind of, you know, Altogether fine. China, Brazil, India. What does it really tell you about, for instance, the purchasing power of these people when you want to go there with your company and sell something and you read the GDP figures and stuff? In reality, it means one shop is enough because the rich all live in Bombay and they can buy everything and the rest is not interested because they have no money for that. And then this is a very delicate thing, of course, in this context. Security and privacy, and I have enumerated the diverse technologies and the international laws and standards. And my comment is this. I mean, we've always, w since, since the introduction of internet as a commercial media, we were confronted with all kinds of disturbances. The first virus, I think, appeared in 78 or something, when the internet was not a public thing, but a very restricted network, usually originally invented by uh, American military administration. And viruses could be transmitted only via floppy disks, if anybody remembers that. You put it in, you know, and got infected because somebody gave it to you, unsecure sources and stuff. In the meantime, basically everybody can do, and there's one big American institution who does it anyway officially already. And I think that European secret services are not as holy as they are playing at the moment. So lots of people are spying into basically almost everything. So if you think about yourself, your own privacy, or the privacy of your company, or your institution, or if a university, an academic organization develops something, 
and would like to keep those data kind of secret because it's really crucial information. Pharmaceutical industry, IT itself anyway. Where and how do you keep those data? Do you have to unplug everything and have it really in the box? No, could be electronic, but box and never plug it again. Unless to another unplugged computer. I mean, you know where this leads. And then I was searching for conclusions. And I said, do we get, do we have to get back before 1995? The top picture is not so visible, but the, this is a school, of course, in America that has no computers. They're using tablets, but the tablets are wooden tablets and they're writing with chalk. It's maybe a little bit radical, but US is called the country of unlimited possibilities. So, okay. This may be one solution. I mean, maybe these ch children are honestly happier. I don't know. Can't say it yet. This is all happening too fast. Or shall we rely only on uh, the physical? So I see you here, so you are here. As soon as you disappear, virtually you don't exist. Could be, it could be one possibility. Or do I say, okay, this is all nothing for me. I give up my career and uh, maybe go to some Pacific island and collect coconuts. Or I get active and say, this can't happen. Join some protest group and start getting destructive. I mean, everything, all of these things are happening in some way or other, but on a small scale. And now we come to the point where I really would like to have your uh, contributions in terms of discussion, because I also need your experiences and your uh, expertise on this. I, I, I postulate that we cannot turn back time but we can change the values maybe. And so far, I realized that data information has basically two major, uh, 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 major attributes. That's quantity, so how much, and quality not in the meaning of good or bad, but with certain attributes, blue, red, green. And it sounds romantic, but it's not that romantic as it sounds. What if we added ethics and emotions and at the same time changed quantity to reduction? I will elaborate on what I mean with it. About quantity, we talked before. Actually, I talked. You didn't talk yet. You still have to talk. Okay? I don't let you walk out without comments. Um, we saw that curve, that exponential curve. And in the very beginning, I talked about mastering information. Uh, and I postulate the more n we need information, or we think we need, because we are made to think we need, the more we're depending on others, on other sources on of information. And the more we support monopolies. So the only thing we can do is reduce, uh, which sounds great, but in reality is quite, dif is quite difficult. Uh, and this is, a, this is a social or a societal process, a process running within society. Because if one of you starts this, it will not help very much. If the whole faculty starts it, it might change something in the Brno area. If the whole republic starts it, which is unlikely, but let's, you know, imagine then some that the world is gonna get attentive and say listen and there's something going on in this country which is very unusual and some companies will say we have to work against this because uh, they're not following us anymore and it's pure fiction now uh, and one of these um, criteria within reduction is to rely more on personal experience so instead of Googling, I go to the elder colleague and say, well, how did you do it and how, what do you think? It's very old fashioned. 
And nowadays in companies, lots of uh, older people are set free because of too high payment. And experience is not really um, anything that counts. And the funny thing is that every company consultant will tell you that experience is such a good thing and that you always have to rely on these um, old experienced people, blah, blah, blah. They were 40 years in the company, which doesn't exist nowadays anyway, any, anyway anymore. And it doesn't happen. It's just the salary. So this might mean a rethinking of company policy. It's okay, I keep a few of these old guys because they know exactly how it works. It's quite interesting. And I don't need external sources of information if I have it in the company or in my organization. These are no recipes. This is just ideas. Um, and the second thing is, in the area of reduction, to increase the responsibility for decisions, which means I cannot rely on my figures anymore. I have to take a decision. I run the risk. If it's wrong, I get fired. If I'm right, we might be successful. But it's not just facts and figures, because we saw how wrong these facts and figures could be. And in this context, I remember that I was originally invited uh, for some seminar that's supposed to happen in Kishanov a few weeks ago. And there we were supposed to uh, discuss business plans. And there you come into this field because business pr plans are forecasts. And a forecast a forecast must rely on something. I mean, how do you tell people that your new service and your new product is going to attract so and so many people in so and so many areas in so and so many countries if you cannot rely on any figures? Actually, the business plan should have one major sentence. All this might be right or all this might be wrong, which no investor will accept, of course, and say, what the hell are you talking about? The funny thing is then they get these 20, 50, 100 pages, very elaborate with all details, 51, 365 units to be sold in Bruno in 2025. Wonderful. But who tells me that next year they don't switch off the electricity and uh, we can't do it anyway? Or some other thing happening, I mean. We had those statistics of that flood and weather meteorological office, you know. I mean, when in last year it was, we had again the floods in Prague. Lots of things were destroyed. Some of the places had to close down. Some restaurants were again affected. Their business plans were for nothing. I mean, these things can always happen. It's very fictitious. And you're very depending on external information. So risk and chance. And reduction of the amount leads automatically to value number two, quality. But this time, I mean quality, not in terms of is it blue or red or green, but this time I really mean good or bad. And all the scale in between, of course. <coughs> I left a space with that last sentence to um, another lecture, maybe, or another discussion, or whatever. Because this issue is especially can lead to much more, the discussion about growth. But this, this, would, this would, you know, make this, this lecture explode because we could discuss growth for days, nights, and months. We'll not find a solution, not an immediate one, and it would go too far. But think about it. World population is growing. <coughs> the economy is supposed to grow information flow and data is growing. At least these three. And we and you and your successors, your children, will have to cope with these three facts. Apart from everything else, consumption, food, uh, electricity, energy, blah, 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 blah. Growth, 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 growth. Par pardon. <laughs> growth. <laughs> this is but in, in this context, you have this discussion, and we cannot close the eyes and say, well, this isn't, you know, we can't do it today, but we have to do it someday. Even if it's being denied, because everybody still nowadays tells us that economic growth is absolutely in, 
necessary, otherwise we can't go on. So maybe someday there is somebody who thinks that there might be a different idea. But as I said, different discussion. I mean, we will have enough time afterwards to discuss so we can discuss the growth stuff as well. Uh, even quality would be too big to discuss today, or not, we'll see. But I have enumerated a few keywords. Selection and verification. If I reduce the amount of data, I have more chances to check whether they are accurate or not. If I have huge amounts of data, you remember that chaotic uh, diagram we had from the Czech consulting office. I mean, you will, you will, never, get, you ne will never get along with that. Uh, that caricature is definitely not serious, but I, I think it happens sometimes. Selection verification, if you have less information, you can, you can work on its quality, you can check whether this is right or wrong, not necessarily with a promised result, but at least you have the time for it. You can put more experience behind it, and you can increase the dialogue. The dialogue really in terms of physical dialogue. I talk with somebody and get his or her opinion on something. And one of my favorite examples, as I mentioned before, is uh, international university rankings. I once checked one of, I, I don't remember which it was, but uh, unfortunately for them, one of these rankings published on the internet their way of how to get those data. And question number one, and this is always upon question, is always based upon questionnaire and on scientific quotations, these rankings. Scientific quotations in international scientific uh, publications. First of all, most of the people who are being asked are English-speaking respondents, because in most cases, you ask in the US, you ask in the UK, and maybe in a few other countries, but um, this is not really balanced. Second, geographic divisions. And this was interesting, because um, in a further on a further level of being asked, you are asked which university, for, for the one of the first questions was which university do you know? So what would anybody of you say? Which universities do you know? Spontaneously. Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, J Yale. <laughs> Doesn't matter, it's not a jail, but maybe it's a jail, but it's, it's Yale. What about certain Masarika Universita? Yeah. Karlova, okay, okay. Now, anyway, Yale, Oxford, blah, blah, blah. Of course, everybody will say that. He will mention most probably the one where he himself or herself was at, and some of the very known ones. You will not mention Sarajevo, you will not mention Athens, you will not mention Lagos, you will not mention um, Hanoi, in most cases, unless you're from there. Okay, so this is one thing. Second thing is, and that was interesting, the search was divided in geographic areas, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. And I don't know whether it was a mistake in just this survey or it was a mistake in all of the surveys because I didn't check them all, that interestingly enough, Austria was in Northern Europe and the Czech Republic was in Southeastern Europe. So if somebody, the, the question is also where do you live or work? If I live in Vienna and I'm asked which universities do you know, in your area, which is in this case Northern Europe, Brno doesn't appear, and Prague, because in Southeastern Europe, and I'm not asked about this, and the other way around. Okay, so this is gone. Then, of course, um, when it comes to uh, counting quotations in scientific journals, most of the scientific journals that count nowadays are English. If you don't publish in English, you basically don't exist. You do, but you're not one of the top top. So think about this. Or develop opposition, publish in Czech, and say I'm still good, even if I publish in Czech. And the other thing is, of course, a little bit provocative, because I said, why are Harvard, Yale, Princeton always at the top of the list? And it's, of course, a PR thing as well. 
Harvard has an annual budget of 32 billion, this is nine zeros, dollars. If I look at the achievements of smaller European universities, like I know, for instance, what the University of Liberec does in terms of nanotechnology, or whatever, here, Budapest, Prague, Vienna, Graz, Innsbruck. They have not even a fraction of that budget. If you put that on a graph, you know, and you make circles, I think these small universities wouldn't even be a full stop. And if I look at the achievements in comparison to the budget, I have to say, Globok <laughs> Dolo. Um, nobody sees that. Uh, Innsbruck, for instance, has a major European center for semantic technologies. Might be interesting, actually, as a connecting, uh, connecting um, f uh, institute for for uh, for KISC, because semantics also play a role, of course, in this context. <coughs> and I say this is also a little bit. Uh, self-fulfilling prof prophecies, because if I, as a parent, pay I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars for the tuition of my children in Harvard, I want my child to become a top manager or a top writer or a top scientist or a top whatever, because I'm sending him there. And when they come back, first of all, the teachers of Harvard will not tell me that your son or your daughter is a complete idiot because the teacher gets my money as his or her salary. I mean, this is a little bit overdone. Yeah? These are not bad universities. But the degree of you know, overdoing this kind of international reputation, this is what I would like to point out as an example for data manipulation, because I realized that in the media this discussion never happens. Nobody asks the question behind this. What I read every year, especially in Austria, Oh my God, Vienna University is again on rank number 132. Oh, we are so bad. Oh, what do we have to do? And then the politicians start, you know, fussing around with a big pot of university regulations. And I realize that it's almost the same here because these countries have an enormous similarity in terms of uh, political decision making. I don't go further now because otherwise we come into a different discussion. And then they stir and say, well, we have to change this rule and we have to change this rule and we have to change this rule. And then we have a new university law and then we have a few more budgets and then we will certainly get better and nothing happens. It doesn't really happen. We don't play a role on an international level. There you have to do com completely different things. And this is also a separate discussion. But you see what's coming into this, you know, when one thinks about it. <coughs> And the other tricky aspect of reduction and changing values in terms of information flow is ethics and emotions. And the questions in the foreground is, of course, how do we get information? So basically, there's the antithesis of legal and illegal, or clean and not clean, uh, and, 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 and similar criteria. For what purpose do we use it? And I mean, in this context, we have everything about industrial espionage, abusing data, and so on and so on. I remember I worked for a while in a quite successful publishing company as editor-in-chief of uh, specialized magazines. And this company also had uh, a book production, not a regular book production, quite expensive stuff on taxes and laws and blah, blah, blah. And these books, because this was the early online age, one still dealt with, you know, large volumes on, 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 on specialized subjects. Um, these books were not classical books, but they were files. And they were produced on a subscription basis, which means that every s two months you got an update, which had the regular holes of the, of the file, and you put, you know, those updates into that file. So basically you got a data collection. And these books were quite expensive. And I remember that that company was collecting addresses of managers and um, institutions and companies that were supposed to get such books and sent them the books, including the, the bill, the invoice. 
and waited until they would pay it or not, even if they didn't order it. And about two thirds of these companies thought that the boss might have ordered these books, so they ordered it. And from that moment on, of course, they were regular subscribers and the book business was running. But basically, um, I, I was not, I did not agree with this method. I didn't like it. I was in the, m in the uh, magazine department, not in the book department. But I did not want our company to follow such methods. So uh, the question who profits from is its processing is again very justified. And then we have the questions in the background and that concerns you. If you're in such a position, would I be ready to discuss ethics with my boss? Which is a very general question. I mean, this you can elaborate on this. Or even earlier, how do I choose my job? And then I gave you an example. Would I accept a well-paid job in an oil sand exploitation company or with an army supplier? You know that oil sand exploitation or fracking is a very controversial method where you extract crude oil from sands on the ground with the help of chemicals. And in Canada they're doing this already on a large scale. In Europe it's under discussion and you can imagine how the lobbies in Brussels are working on this because Brussels is the second biggest lobbying uh, capital in the world after Washington, of course. And uh, something which is related to it in a similar field is that, for instance, I learned a few days ago that south of uh, Prague in the area of uh, Pshibram, I think, a gold mining company would like to start extracting gold with the cyanide extracting method from the ground. This is something that is being followed, for instance, aus in Australia or in Chile. And every year, 180,000 tons of cyanide get into groundwater via this method. In Chile, nobody checks that. In Romania, they had a few accidents with this method a few years ago, and uh, people managed to stop these companies. And I hope that Shibram will not be a gold mining center, even if they promise workplaces. This is how the country looks like when you do oil sand exploitation. This is in Canada. And it's not painted, it's a photograph. Just to frighten you off a bit. Before we come to the second part, because I have to keep my promise and talk about internet and book, and you realize that both words are metaphorical in the meantime. Now I really want to uh, open the discussion, especially about the uh, fact that we are confronted with information and data. We learn how to process them. We have to use them or abuse them and the ethics and the questions behind it. So you said nobody so far has been in a kind of corresponding job in, in any company or in an internship in the area of, not as a McDonald's salesman, I mean information management, of course. But McDonald's would be also interesting, of course. Now, what do you think about all this? Has, have you ever been confronted with this issue in this way? Yes, no, there's you have only one chance to answer one of these two. It's like bits and, you know, digital technology uh, remains basically on yes and no answers. This is the smallest transistor, you know, this is the smallest unit, how you can give the bits and bytes a value. So yes or no? Discussed? Yes? Yes? No? You did? How was it? The question is: The question is, have you ever been confronted with the question of um, the growth of data and information, their qualities and, and levels, like um, uh, good or bad, and whether you have any any you had any any confrontation with the, with the fact that maybe information management is not just a future job or, a, or, a, or a, a direction in your studies, but might also be a problem. 
and how to deal with it. You know, this kind of flow of, of, of thoughts like I developed it now. Have you ever had this discussion anywhere? Okay. Okay, I repeat that so that it's also being recorded. So one of our participants has already been working with information. Okay. Okay, business intelligence, yeah. And is there kind of a kind of a, a discussion on this, like uh, how do we get data, how do we process them, what do we use them for? Okay. And let me guess, you're working for a medium, small and medium-sized company, yeah. most probably. So basically, it's not you're not sitting at, at the, the core of such problems yet. And is, is was this this was an internship or you are working currently? currently is this a company that might deal with let's say ethically problematic data or is it something that's kind of everyday thing which is nothing one has to think much about? Um, uh, sometimes we are working with uh, data about the property of the customers, so. Um, uh, it might be some uh, like, uh, views on this data. Okay. okay. And have you ever had a conflict on this? Like uh, that somebody said, well, we cannot do that because it's not right? Not yet. Not yet. But it was also, there was, I mean, th th there was no um, like controversial issue yet on this. Okay. Did you get what it was about? I mean, it, it uh, w w we haven't been confronted with this yet. H has anybody. Uh, ever thought about the dimension of the, the the things as I described them yet, like this kind of influx of information on everybody, the growth, the ability to deal with them. Anybody uh, had anybody has uh, had a discussion on this yet? Or would you let's let, let's do it the other way around. If Google came here with the recruiting department and said there's a few very good people here uh, would like you to work with us. Would you or wouldn't you? Or would you? Yes, but under certain conditions, which Google is never going to fulfill, of course. But would it create a conflict in you? A possible conflict, potential conflict? Or would you say, what, <laughs> 5,000 euros, I'm there. <laughs> a month, not a year. Or, I don't know, fracking company needs people for information management. Supermarket chain needs somebody who's working on the, you know, customer cards. Or even on the cameras in the shop to see, you know, Behavior, this is very important, you know, for the arrangement of things in the supermarket to see how people shop. You have the most attractive things usually on eye level. A very detailed analysis on these things, you know. How can we make them shop more, you know? Actually, we should shop less. Shopping as such is an, uh, as all these things, I mean, I, I, I never mentioned that, but we're talking instruments, not lifestyle. We we had the discussion in the beginning. I said I'm, I'm I've been working with these things since their uh, emergence, but I never got into the trap to consider this a lifestyle. This is just this is a tool. And then we come back to the growth discussion because I mean, if I look at the growth of supermarkets outside the cities, I'm glad I have my little Vietnam shop around the corner. You know where I can get my stuff. I don't want to go five kilometers to such a a uh, uh, caddy uh, to, to collect, you know, tons and tons and tons of stuff. But this is what they want. And they would like the small shops to die. And they want to be the only ones. In Austria, you basically have only four supermarket chains and that's it. You have a few Turkish shops that cater for the large Turki Turkish minority and you can get other stuff as well. But otherwise you have Billa, you have uh, Hofer, Lidl, 
and the fourth one, and that's it. And this after a while, I guess, in Spanien, of course, one of them will try to buy the other one. So there's three left, and then this, the we have only two. And the, those logos I showed you, I mean, look at the palette of companies that Nestle or Procter and Gamble own. Basically, every regular cosmetic you buy is, I don't know, is by Procter and Gamble. Yes, please. Yes. So, so, and I don't, I don't know how to grow. So, so I, repeat I, do I repeat the question, how can I, as a single person, basically, <laughs> do something against the monopoly of big units? This is generalizing. Like, yeah. Companies, but on the other hand, what, <laughs> what else can I do? Well, I mean, this goes a lot beyond this discussion, but if you allow, we, if you allow, we discuss it, if you're fine with that. Uh, you know, one thinks that not going to be loved means automatically, you know, in kind of mathematical setting, you go to Skliseno or Czeski Grund, you know, which is fabulous product, but quite expensive. We don't. We go to the farmer's market, but the potatoes are almost as cheap as at Lidl. And we're thinking about what we could do later on to get more and more independent of these things. And we have reduced meat consumption a lot. This is a completely different discussion. And we're coming into this growth discussion I mentioned before. But basically, um, I realized that in, in, in certain aspects, you can't escape them at the moment. But you can do one thing. I mean, you spread the thought talk to people, go on internet forums, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have all kinds of stuff. And there's lots of groupings already around. I mean, there's lots of alternatives happening. There's lots of alternatives, for instance, on the monetary system. In lots of countries, small villages don't pay with their regular currency anymore, but do exchange business. This is all a little bit of here and a little bit of there. Sometimes looks very esoteric and very strange. But on the other hand, if you remember the picture with that oil sand extraction thing, I'd rather go into the direction of the small esoteric solution and try to find whether I can live with it than to have that. And this is just one example. If we go into this area and we come into this discussion, I can give you an infinite list of things happening and you will afterwards tell me that guy sees only black and this is just negative and this is what I don't want to be. I rather point out alternatives. But your question is very s uh, justified. What can I do? But the little bubbles help. The little bubbles helped in Ukraine. Let's see how it goes on. In Egypt it didn't work, I'm afraid. But Ukraine, Ukraine is Europe, at least. You know, I mean, uh, in all these countries, people say, well, well, what the hell can I do? Hmm? What the hell can I do that Mr. Zeman is not drunk anymore, you know? And so on. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, nonsense. But uh, I think that we have no recipes for those things. And we have no recipes for being confronted with the fact that, for instance, my bank account was once hacked and I had three identical payments to a Taiwanese furniture company. I could say I canceled the bank account, but in this case, I could not have booked my bus ticket this morning via student agency online. I would have to go, you know, to the ticket counter and get my ticket. And I could not book my seat online. So it's not that I say this is all bad and we have to jump back to the trees I, uh, or, or get, you know, wooden tablets and writing with chalk. But we have to come back to an instrumental use of these things for the good of everybody. I mean, I sound like a priest now, but there is something behind this. And maybe we find a compromise between radical solutions. I don't want to be a cyber being, and I don't want to be a, a, a monkey on the tree. And we have a brain to think that out. This is the, the big advantage. Everybody of us has a brain to think about it, you know. We just don't have to follow like lemmings. 
Has everybody, anybody, any seen the very old movie Soylent Green? This is a post-apocalyptic scenario from the 70s in an overpopulated world <coughs> where the dead people are collected with uh, street cleaning machines and then later processed into food and nobody does it. No one knows that. And people get three trademarks of food, Soylent Green, Soylent Yellow and Soylent Brown and the green is always sold out, you know. And then somebody finds out about how this works because this is all kept secret. You know, I mean, uh, we don't have to think in extremes, but we should actually, all of us, think about, especially in responsible positions, and you will be in quite responsible positions. That's why I'm addressing people like you. Because you're not just a client and a customer, you might also be decision makers. And maybe I should come back to the second part because this has a small connection with that. <sighs> any, any, any questions to that first part? Uh, thanks for the contributions, by the way. Um, I promised to talk about the book, so I'll talk about the book. And the interesting thing is it's more important than one might think. And uh, I asked that question, why now talk about the book? Because the book is a very classical container of information or medium, as you like. And I gave two reasons, literacy and education and the limited life cycle of electronic storage media. So why do I say that? <coughs> and in between, some romantic view on the issue. Jorge Luis Borges might be familiar to some of you, uh, Nobel Prize winner for literature, and he says, of course, I mean, this is, of course, his vision, I believe books will never disappear, because otherwise history would uh, disappear, and so would man. There is something to it, but definitely it's, uh, it's rather a romantic view of the thing. But definitely, books are an essential, essential part of general education. The thing is, in a digital world, you have to have basically a quite high degree of education to be able to deal with it. Dumb heads cannot deal with computers. And in this context, the deciphering of a code is important, and the deciphering of a code is reading. If you can't read properly and if you can't write properly, uh, you can't deal with those things and you can't work and exist in the information age. And the point is, uh, a Twitter message doesn't have very much romanticism and emotional uh, background. A book does. The physical book, and think about the time when you were small children in bed and reading your picture book. Of course you can do that with a tablet. It's half as much fun. Um, children learn reading not via TV and not via the internet, but by this kind of combination of emotional and, uh, and cognitive, you know, getting in, into the world of literacy. And what we see nowadays, and this is the dangerous thing, there is a growing discrepancy between dropping basic educational skills, those bloody PISA tests every year, show that reading capacities are reducing with school children. And youth unemployment in some countries has reached 50%. Not because there are no jobs, but because the companies say that there are no qualified young people, because they can't read, write and calculate. And this is the dangerous development, because young people who have no job nowadays will not have a job as grown-ups. And this is something in Finland, in the parade country of school education. Everybody said, we have to go to Finland and have a look. You have a youth unemployment of 20%. And this has something to do with basic skills. And this is a plaidoyer, again, for reviving the education in basic skills. I don't grow up with a chi chip in my head, you know, so that I'm able to do this right away. 
And if this is a plaidoyer for the book, definitely we're not talking about non-fiction stuff. I'm not talking about phone directories. I'm not talking about address books. I'm glad that these things get out of the paper into the digital box. But everything else, and this is a little illustration that I found when I was looking at libraries, books and stuff, to give you an image of what I was thinking when I talked about little children reading books, you know. <coughs> and the second criteria, which is a very strong argument, is the limited life cycle of electronic storage media, and this is really dangerous. The floppy disk disappeared, basically. Those people who had stuff on the floppy disk either tried to get it to some different storage or it's kind of lost. You remember, some of you might remember that yourself. The most reliable, obviously, medium is the magnetic tape, but who the hell has these machines at home? I mean, this is something for big corporations and those who storage data in, in mass amounts. So what we have is the hard disk drive on the PC, the external hard disk drive. If my own, at home, my hard disk drive breaks down, I'll get mad because I have basically, I, I, what I'm doing now is, and you will think I'm mad, I'm storing half of my stuff on Google Drive and half of my stuff on the, on the external hard disk drive. Now, if Google once says, well, my services are not free anymore, you have to pay, <coughs> what shall I do? But on one hand, this hard disk drive gets full very quickly. The external hard disk drive is also not really safe, and Google Drive is even unsafer, because they know everything I have anyway, but there's nothing to hide. So what do I do? The only, the point is, do you know what the screen is about? A screen is LED elements lit by electronic impulses. This is not reality, these are not data, this doesn't exist, it's virtual. It's a flow of electrons. Physical information is if I print it out. I can't change it anymore. It's printed, it's there, and it holds between 100 and 1,000 years. The uh, Bible Kralitska is 500 years old, and the Laholitsa texts are 1,000 years old. They still somehow exist in fragments. This stuff, what do we do with these amounts of data? I mean, permanently converted? Now, Windows XP will lose the support by Windows. So everybody who has Windows will, I don't know, migrate to Unix or something else or Windows 8 and blah, blah, blah. Some of the stuff that were running on Windows XP, I'm sure they're not going to run. So you have to think about every little detail you need. And this is me and one person. So what about a big company? Lots of companies are protesting because some of the systems they have are still running on Windows XP. We are depending on a technology, and by the way, we're also depending on electricity. This is something I'm not going to discuss today. What if somebody one day switches it off? Do we all go to the bicycle to run that thing? And then it goes then up and down, you know. So this is really something you have to think about in your future departments. Um, this is what I just said. You might be decision makers, you might be responsible managers. Some of you might become teachers, scientists. But I hope that I could, uh, you know, uh, release some impulses with this lecture. That's why I went far beyond the original issue. And uh, if this discussion hasn't happened yet, so it happened today, and I hope that uh, you're satisfied. We're almost at the end. We still have about 10 minutes to discuss. So again, opening for discussion about books and physical media and printed stuff and the practical value or the romantic value behind them. Yes, please. Uh-huh. Why don't companies not invent media to store data on a long-term basis? Which means that beyond 30, 100 years, um, because it's so difficult. I mean, this is not... Uh, 
I, I once had a, a conversation with um, a professor from the Vienna Technical University in a department whose name I don't remember, but they were doing research on simply new f physical storage in certain metal compositions. So they were really, this was basic research, this was not applied research. And they went into the molecular structure of certain materials to see how electric impulses could manipulate the structure of this metal to stay then in this influence. You know, it's just like as if you have, I don't know, um, think about a big speaker, horizontal, and that commercial where they put the little silver balls on it. And when that speaker starts producing music, those balls jump into certain patterns. So if you're ma able to keep the pattern, you have that one tone at that one second where I don't know the balls are in a certain position. This happens also in a molecular structure, but it is not stable. That's the problem. The tapes, uh, I was actually surprised about the fact that the tapes are the longest lasting mediums. I thought, for instance, flash disk would be the longest lasting medium. They promised us when they introduced the CD and the DVD that they would hold forever and that you could kick them with the foot and you could put them into the dirt and nothing would happen. Huh? Have one little scratch on it and it's fucked up. When I, <laughs> I went to Vienna a few days ago, I wanted to see um, one of the novels by John Irving on a DVD. It was a brand new DVD, but it was five years old. I took it out of the package, really originally sealed, put it into the drive, it didn't work. The surface was perfect for my eyes, not for the microscope. I couldn't do anything. Okay, so I couldn't watch the movie. Little example, you know, I mean, of course they are fighting in those film archives with you know, the, the decaying qualities of the, of, the, of the celluloid stripe, but still, I mean, there have been, some of those movies are already 100 years old. And now we are digitalizing libraries. I'm sure you are confronted with this. And I'm, I'm very happy because I see a lot of stuff online I couldn't have found otherwise, other, unless I ran there physically. But how long does it last? I mean, this costs an enormous amount of money. How long does it last? And on which medium? And which media even if big corporations, institutions, organizations have all these means, um, do I with my system have still access to that? I mean, in the next 20 years, you know? One comparison. Until a few years ago, we had a regular light bulb. 40, 60, 100 watts, blah, blah, blah. Now, you have 50 different ones, you have different sockets. I have no idea anymore which one is what, which saves most of the electricity, how long it lasts, and so on and so on. That standard is gone. They ruined it. And I'm afraid the same thing will happen with these things. The standard just saves something. When I opened my presentation yesterday, after a lot of work, some of the pictures were gone because the firewall was blocking it. I'm very happy about it. Who asked me? The firewall didn't ask me, you know. And, and uh, you know, I mean, in on, on one of the first slides, when I wrote that I studied uh, Italian, French, and English linguistics and literature, the L in linguistics was a capital, and in literature it was small. I discovered that mistake, I corrected it three times, and if you go back to that file, the L is still a capital. It just simply doesn't want me to, you know? Small things. If you print it, it's printed. Finished. Questions? I hope I didn't scare you off. Um, I think we're almost at the end. Would you like to give a comment on this or you? today and uh, if you don't have any further questions we can uh, we can end this lecture thank you very much thanks, thanks. so it's closed, closed.